On the dark nights in the jungles of Vietnam, Spooky was an infantryman's best friend. Also called Puff the Magic Dragon, Spooky was a specially outfitted U.S. Air Force AC-47 aircraft designed to provide support to soldiers on the ground. Carrying 21,000 rounds of 7.62 millimeter ammunition, the aircraft's three miniguns could accurately fire up to 6,000 rounds per minute to repulse enemy attacks. Spooky offered a comforting sense that you were not alone. With the protection of an incredible trio of machine guns, all with the capability to turn even the darkest of nights into an artificial day, Spooky was your greatest asset at night. On the evening of February 24, 1969, the dangers were all too real. From their sanctuary deep in the jungles, Viet Cong and North Vietnamese soldiers began their attacks on several American positions. It was a night for fear, a night for death, a night for spooky to work its magic. On this night, Major Kenneth Carpenter skillfully piloted Spooky 71. For over four hours, Carpenter and his crew worked their magic to the unheard cheers of joy from soldiers on the ground. As it neared 11 o'clock, word reached Major Carpenter's cockpit on the American soldiers under attack near Long Bend. Carpenter gathered his bearings from the navigator and turned Spooky 71 towards the scene of combat. Reaching the engagement zone, Spooky flew in at a low altitude. Carpenter's loadmaster, Airman First Class John Lee Levitow, worked with 71's crew to keep the miniguns firing. With ease, Levitow and crew performed their duties flawlessly, giving Carpenter the much needed confidence to do what needed to be done. As the magnesium flares swung from their parachutes to light the area, Major Carpenter rained his miniguns on the enemy, successfully destroying two mortar positions in his initial attack. A third mortar position had just been located. Carpenter banked Spooky 71 hard left for another pass over the enemy position. In the cargo hold, Airman Levitow removed another flare from the rack, set the timer, and passed it to Airman First Class Ellis Owen. He was prepared to toss the canister from the open door, but suddenly, Spooky's nighttime magic ran out, and the nightmare in the air began. Banking for a second run over the enemy at slightly above 1,000 feet, Spooky had flown directly into the path of an 82 millimeter enemy mortar round. More than 3,500 pieces of shrapnel ripped through the body of the cargo hold, peppering the soft flesh of all four men working there. Carpenter struggled for control of the floundering aircraft. He knew 71 was in grave danger, but never could have imagined just how present that danger was. In the cargo hold, nothing stirred. All four crewmen were violently thrown to the floor by the explosion, and many were injured by the flying shrapnel that just pierced through the air. Levitow tried shaking off the dizziness that swarmed his mind. He felt like he was struck a crushing blow by a large piece of wood. Not exactly, but 40 pieces of shrapnel struck him on the right side moments ago, shredding his legs and back with wounds now bleeding profusely. As the aircraft continued to lurch about, Levitow noticed one of the gunners perilously near the open cargo door. One wrong shift of the troubled airplane, and he could be thrown through that doorway to certain death. Struggling to get his feet under him, John felt intense pain wash through every muscle of his body, save for his legs, which were now numb. But determined to help his crewmate, John pulled himself upright and willed his feet forward towards the doorway. Spooky continued to bounce and vibrate through the air. Levitel was slowly working his way towards the airman in peril. Weakened by the unchecked flow of blood from his wounds, Airman Levitel sought deep within his soul to find the strength to pull his comrade to safety. Using everything he had in that moment, John started moving backward and, before he knew it, they were there. John pulled the injured airman clear of the doorway, but the celebration wouldn't last long. As he moved the wounded airman, John noticed a wisp of smoke inside the cargo hold. A fire would prove disastrous in a confined compartment holding thousands of ammunition rounds and several magnesium MK24 flares. The nightmare only worsened after John's realization. The smoke wasn't coming from a fire. It was one of the flares. The 27 pound smoking flare was the same one John had set the timer for only seconds earlier and passed to Gunner Owen to toss through the doorway. Somehow, either by traveling the 10 foot distance of the lanyard or because the gunner's hand was near the safety ring at the time, the pin had been released and the flare was now armed for a series of explosions in less than 20 seconds. The plane still bouncing and turning as he reached towards the canister, quickly rolling just beyond his grasp. Ignoring his own pain, Levitau followed the elusive canister. 
reaching for a second time, but again, rolling beyond his grasp. Moving on legs that now felt non-existent, the intrepid airman carefully positioned himself for a third attempt to intercept the deadly flare. But there was no charm in a third time, only more delay in a situation that now seemed beyond hope. John knew what he had to do. Throw his wounded body across the 20-foot long canister. But even a valiant and sacrificial effort such as this could not save the crew of Spooky 71. If the bomb exploded, John's body would shield his comrades from immediate danger. But as the magnesium began its 3,000 degree slow burn, it would melt through the metal floor of the airplane to detonate the fuel and light the evening skies with a brilliant, explosive demise of Spooky and its crew. Recognizing the outcome, John began the most dangerous journey of his life, a slow crawl to the open cargo door. Smoke wafted from the tip of the flare as the final seconds ticked off, but John crawled on, dragging his badly torn and bleeding legs behind him. Spooky continued the fight to remain airborne. Its desperate gyrations banked the floor at sharp inclines. John struggled onward, fighting pain, gravity, and a time frame that had almost run out. Reaching the door, flare still tightly in his grasp, John mustered his last ounce of strength to throw the 27-pound bomb into the night. As the flare passed through the doorway, it was caught by the prop wash. Time ran out. The flare exploded into a brilliant glare that illuminated the night sky over Long Bend. It was close, but it had been enough. Unaware of what just transpired, Major Carpenter reigned Spooky 71 under some semblance of control and set an emergency course for the airstrip at Bien Ho. Once landed, medical crews raced to remove the wounded crew members and rush them to an aid station. John Levitow remembered little of those 10 seconds where he forced his body to do the impossible. But in the light of day, as Major Carpenter surveyed the damage to his AC-47, it wasn't hard to put the pieces together. Following the blood trails Airman Levitow streaked across the floor, Carpenter could easily reconstruct those few frantic moments. Shaking his head in amazement, he later said, I'll never know, I'll never know how Levitow managed to reach the flare and throw it out. In my experience, I have never seen such a courageous act performed under such adverse conditions. Slowly, John Levitow began to recover from his wounds, eventually returning to fly 20 more missions over Vietnam. It would be six months after that fateful evening on February 24th, 1969, John Levitow would finish his military commitment and be honorably discharged from the Air Force as a sergeant. Though the story of his valiant efforts during the nightmare on Spooky 71 were taking on legendary proportions, John remained humble about what he did and was content with returning to his quiet hometown of Glastonbury, Connecticut. Despite his humility, Airman John Levitow's actions could not escape recognition. On May 14, 1970, President Richard Nixon invited the young former airman to the White House for a special Armed Forces Day ceremony. Eleven veterans of the war in Vietnam were there to join him. Five from the Army, three from the Navy, two Marines, and one Air Force officer. On that day, President Nixon honored the valor of the 12 young men by presenting each with the Medal of Honor. All were special, but John's award was to become unique. Of the 16 men who received medals of honor for service in the new U.S. Air Force, Airman First Class John Lee Levitow was the first enlisted airman to receive his nation's highest award. Levitow became an Air Force icon. The requests for his presence at military ceremonies often far exceeded those of other medal recipients. John summoned the same fortitude that enabled him to do the impossible one fateful night in Vietnam. In late 1999, John Levitow found himself in a desperate battle for life with a new enemy, cancer. Chemotherapy followed along with the removal of a kidney. The ordinary hero from Glastonbury fought to survive. Sadly, on November 8, 2000, John Lee Levitow finally retired at the all too young age of 55. Never one to speak of himself, John Levitow became more than a hero to thousands of Air Force enlisted personnel including officers. He challenged all to love their country and strive to do their very best in service to freedom. John will always be remembered for his actions that evening on February 24th, 1969. Read John Levitow's full story on homeofheroes.com forward slash heroes stories under Vietnam War.
And this history flashback is brought to you by Legal Help for Veterans, PLLC, nationwide VA disability law firm. Visit LegalHelpForVeterans.com for more information.